What's up, Vanguard? Good morning, good evening, whatever time you're watching this. Um, we've got a pretty special set for you. Um, Grace put it together to just kind of take you on a journey from the cross to the grave to the resurrection. Um, and it's so fitting coming off of this Easter weekend because um, we celebrate the resurrection, but we also mourn the death beforehand. Um, so I just encourage you guys to take this time to really reflect on what Easter is about, whether you were at church and with family all weekend or you were in your dorm, not really sure what this weekend's even all about. Um, Jesus died for you and he, res he was resurrected for you. Um, and that's a pretty big thing to celebrate. So like I said, just take this time, really reflect on what it's all about. So with that, let's pray. Father God, we just welcome you into this, into this space. God, I bless each of these musicians that any of their nerves are gone, that everything goes smoothly. And God, everybody watching this now, later, who knows when, that they are blessed, that you speak to them and you speak to each one of us leading God. God, it was because of you and your son that we are here today, and we want to recognize that and praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. search the world but it couldn't fill me man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough oh then you came along and put me back together Nothing is better 
Because the God of the mountain, He is the God of the valley. Oh, and there's not a place Your mercy and grace won't find me again.
Jesus, you are our King, Lord of heaven and Savior of the world. So good, Lord. There's no words to describe, God. We thank you for what you did for us. That because of you, we get to stand here. Because of you, we get to sing and play and live our lives for the glorification of your kingdom. Only because of you. We're starting a new series called Adopted. It's out of Romans 8. It's going to last for a few weeks and the picture for it is the silhouette of a person and there's the sky and the stars and the moon and the sunset behind them. Check your emails, you'll see it. And it's beautiful because this person is looking up at the Father in the sky. How many times when we were a kid did we look at our father or our mom or whoever our guardian was and say, pick me up. I'm your child. We were all adopted into this kingdom, and Pastor Mike is going to give a great message about that in just a few moments. So would you guys just sit in that and pray with me as we bless Pastor Mike and his message. So God, one more time, we just thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. God, I just pray that Pastor Mike's message comes across clear and succinct and direct, that whatever your Holy Spirit has for us is only what he speaks. As he brings this new message in to start, that hearts are opened, eyes will see and ears will hear. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning, Vanguard University. You probably heard the worship band, a few others say that this morning, and uh, it is good to be with you. Well, sort of. I am actually on a mountain uh, near Arrowhead, uh, Pinecrest, which is the same camp that really God awakened my heart in, well, I don't even know what year it would have been. It would probably be, golly, uh, 1988, the year the Dodgers won the World Series that year. Obviously, they won last year as well, thank goodness. But uh, I'm up on this mountain, yeah, for some time with my family, with uh, Easter and everything going on. But I I, uh, I was just stricken by God's, God's faithfulness in my life. And he's faithful to you as well. And I'm going to unpack why God is faithful to you. Uh, I'll give you some testimony, but I want to help you see God in your life, the love of the Father that he has for you. In a few moments, I'm going to pray. Please excuse these obnoxious AirPods. I don't have my microphone I usually use, so I'm, gonna, I'm with these, but you'll probably pick up some sounds with the birds chirping, which actually is probably pretty nice up here on the mountain, and uh, we'll, we'll go forward. So let me pray, and let's ask God to bless this as we open this new series, Adopted. I have the privilege and the honor of kicking off this series. And so let's pray as God speaks to our hearts through his word and through the illumination of the Holy Spirit. So Father, you are our Father. Even as we just celebrated the resurrection from the dead with Jesus Christ, we get to celebrate every week the Lord's day. God, we recognize your love for us. Now, Lord, help us to hear your voice through your word. May you open our hearts. May our hearts be open to receive from you, God, that we may know what it means to be loved by the Father above. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. God laid this series on my heart. Well, before our new semester in spring of 2021 began, and I really had this overwhelming sense that if I needed to know the love of the Father, I know that, that students at Vanguard, they have got to be in a similar boat in one way or another. Maybe you have a loving father that you grew up with. Praise God for that. A, a father that disciplines you when necessary, but loves you and embraces you whether you do right or wrong. Maybe you had an abusive father 
or a distant father, a distant father like me or a, a abusive stepdad like me, whatever the case may be, we have all had different experiences with our earthly fathers, if any experience at all. Some of us don't even know our earthly fathers. And many of us, I would say, have, whether you know it or not, we've adopted unknown fathers. Uh, my two uncles, my mom's brothers, who are, neither of them are firm believers in Christ, and I pray they will be soon. They, uh, they also, they became what I would call surrogate fathers to me. They give me good examples of what a good man should do and taking care of his family, working hard and all the things that are there. And I'm thankful for that. But there's something about the love of the father and that our earthly fathers we would hope would exemplify. I hope I exemplify to my three children, Michaela, Rama, and Caleb. And I hope when they're older, they say my dad was a good dad. I hope I, I, I want to hear them say that on this side of heaven. But I want to get into this series of adopted because it's an important word, adopted. What does that mean? And you'll hear some of our speakers in this next couple of weeks speak from Romans chapter 8, verses 12 through 17, which speaks of being adopted. But also 1 John 3, 1 through 10, which also talks about our adoption. That is our recognition as children of God. I'm going to start out with the Romans 8, 12 through 17 passage. And as I just prayed, I'm going to actually read out of the NLT for this first passage. It says this in verse 12 of Romans chapter 8. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you live by its dictates, you will die. But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received the spirit, sp God's Spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father. For his Spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are his children... We are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share in his glory, we must also share in his suffering. May God bless his word as we dig into it. On the morning of my mom's wedding, I remember it. Now you're probably thinking, how is that possible? That was my mom's wedding with my stepdad. I was five years old. And my stepdad, Rick, I remember sitting at a table at breakfast with he and his brothers and groomsmen. And in one way I felt special because I was one of the guys. But in another way I felt lost because I wasn't with my dad. I suddenly was thrown in this new mix of men who I had no clue who they were. And some were kind, some were distant, others were just guys I... I didn't really like much from a young age because, and for good reason, and I don't have time to go into it, but my, my stepdad's family was, let's just say, chaotic. And I, I remember my mom and stepdad getting married and this whole quandary of do I call him dad or not? And so finally my, mom's, my mom said, call him dad. And I felt like I was betraying my dad. But he was with us and so I began to call him dad. Well, he wasn't much of a dad or a father because as time went on, as you know, my testimony, some of you, he began to abuse my mom, uh, physically abuse me, uh, physically abuse my sister and the list goes on. But it's not about that. I want to hold on to this area where there was talk that my stepdad was going to adopt us. Now, if he was going to legally adopt my sister and I, that would mean then we take on his last name. Now, I didn't want this. I called him dad out of honor of my mom. And because he was, for lack of a better description, the father in the home. And I still called my dad, dad. And I had to call my dad, Phil dad, or real dad, and Rick, Rick dad, to distinguish between the two when we were younger. And that's how we distinguished between which dad we were talking about. But there was often talk of him adopting us. And I didn't want that adoption because I didn't want to be known as his son. Now you're like, wait, aren't we talking about being loved by the father? Yes, we'll get there. But I'm telling you my story because even though I rarely ever saw my actual dad, I certainly did not want Rick as my adopted dad because I knew what my dad provided and I knew my grandpa and grandma Whitford and I wanted to keep that name because I love my grandpa and grandma Whitford who were more of godly parents to me than my own parents. 
And so there was this thing that God enabled me to keep. And so even though I was uh, Phil's son, my, my dad, Phil Whitford, uh, my grandparents became kind of a, another identity for me with regard to my last name, Whitford, which is with me to this day. Thank, thank the Lord. And so it was this, this almost re-adoption that I had to go through to understand because there was a confusion. Like, do I, do I identify with my Rick dad or to my, my dad and his family? And so by keeping that last name, it was almost like a re-adoption. But this was only in the natural. And I'm using the natural as an example because we're going to get to the spiritual here. So as we reflect on the beauty of Good Friday and the, and the resurrection of Easter Sunday and what Jesus did on the cross for us, I will I, I, we can be on the shout of a doubt, hold fast to this Romans 8 passage that I just read and be encouraged by God's John 3, 16, love that he has for the whole world and for you and for me. But I want to explore more to go deeper in this love of God that translates into adoption. That is as his children. That's a huge deal that you and I are children of God. But what does that mean? We hear it a lot. And most of us, I think, would say, yeah, I'm a child of God. Sure. We joke about it. You know, when uh, the, I think of Veggie Tales, I'm sorry, I go to Josh in the big wall and the little French peas are like, hello, children, the children of Israel. And uh, anyway, you'd have to watch Veggie Tales if you haven't. It's for a younger generation. Maybe you did grow up with it, but we are children of God. And so because we are adopted by the Father, as this Romans 8 passage says in verse 15, and we call him Abba, which is translated Daddy. We call him daddy, father. Daddy is more of a, a term of endearment. Father is his function. He covers us. But daddy is that intimate thing that says, daddy, you cry out to him. I can't honestly remember calling my dad daddy. And I certainly didn't call my stepdad daddy. But to call a father daddy, which my kids do, that's an intimate thing. I would rather be called daddy than anything else as it pertains to my children to me. And I believe this is the love of the Father, this intimacy that we get to have with God as we are adopted. And so the first thing we see in this passage, verses 12 through 13, is that we live in and are led by the Spirit's power. Now, what does that have to do with adoption? Well, it's clear that if we are adopted by the Father and we put the deed, excuse me, the death, the deeds of our sinful nature, we will live. And for all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. And so as we are led by the Spirit, we are God's children. So there's a connection between living by the Spirit and our identity as children of God. They are connected together. We cannot escape this. And so I want to make sure that as we identify as children of God, as adopted children of God, that we understand this beauty of the Spirit in us as we seek to live. Now, does that, by the Spirit, now, does that mean that we won't make mistakes? No, we will make mistakes or miss snakes, as I just said, as I just made a mistake in saying the word mistake. We will make mistakes, but God has given us a new way of life in the Spirit. See, from a young age, I've had a deep sense of right from wrong, and I believe it was a spiritual uh ingrained mechanism the Lord gave me because I had to see right from wrong as I saw my mom making her choices, my stepdad, and all the things going on. I had to have a, a true north, a clarity of understanding right from wrong because I could sense the wrong that my stepdad was leading us in. And I knew that God was pulling me in a different direction than where that was going. See, I first encountered the Spirit's power on this mountain right here. It was at Pinecrest when I was in seventh grade and I experienced the power of the Holy Spirit at the altar. When the, the, the speaker, he was the big O. I don't even remember his name. All I know is he's the big O. Dynamic speaker, preacher of the word of God, called people up to repent of their sin. And I came up to turn away from my sin as a young seventh grader. I gave up everything I knew how to give up that was something that the Holy Spirit had shown me that I had done wrong. And then I remember my youth pastor, Benny Perez, coming and touching my back and just praying over me. And I just began to weep. I don't even know why. It was as if all the lack of the loving father that I did not have growing up, all in that moment, the love of the father came rushing in just through that touch of my youth pastor. 
just put a hand on my shoulder, that's it, and prayed over me. And suddenly something broke inside of me. I remember it to this day, and like a flood, just tears welled up, and yes, Snotsville came. It was just giving up of, of me. And this would happen from that morning to the evening that night to the next day. And God, I, I literally in three or four services, cleaned me out, began a new journey of cleaning me out. And I, look, trust me, I went to the altar a lot. Once I discovered that was a conduit where I could connect with God, I didn't know how to really before then. I realized I, I wanna keep connecting with my father. And I had, was on this journey of learning what this meant. Well. Went home and I felt brand new. My mom couldn't believe it. I did chores. I did everything she asked me to with joy. She was like, who is, who is this kid? And it's because I first experienced the Spirit's power, which is connected to the love of the Father. And I, that's why this caught me, that the Spirit's power in our lives, as we live by the Spirit, we are children of God. And so may we continue to receive the Word as we grow in the Lord. And I pray that's what you're receiving now. And we worship God in his fullness, because it's through him that we have life through the Holy Spirit. So we live in and are led by the Spirit's power. The second thing we see in this passage is that we are children of God. Now, I already said it, but that's verse 14. We are children of God because we're led by the Spirit. My dad worked for the airlines, an old airline called Air Cow, which was bought out by American Airlines later on. But he was at this, in this his place of work, and he was he was, you know, stately and he was doing what he loved to do. And I knew it. I could sense it. And so when I would go to the airport where my dad worked and we were maybe going to fly to uh, from Reno, Nevada, when we lived there for a few years to Southern California, where I was born to be with my grandparents, I remember his fellow employees recognizing me as Phil's kid. And it was an honor to be known as Phil's kid. Yes, I loved being known as Phil's kid because we had the same last name. And that's my dad. That's my dad. And... Um, though it was rare in recognition, it was important in my development as a young child. I had my name and I had a dad. And so it's in this we need to know that we are God's children. You are God's kid. You are his child. You are his son. You are his daughter. And that's just the general thing. Just be known as God's kid. Just accept it. You're God's kid. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior because of what Jesus did at the cross, you are now a child of God. You are God's kid. Let yourself be known as God's kid. Just take that on. You just say, I accept it. I'm God's kid. I'm God's kid. And some people will recognize that. Oh, that that's one of God's kids. And maybe they'll be like, that's one of God's kids. Oh, they don't do any, like we want to do this stuff. And they're like not doing it. Maybe, maybe you're God's kid at Vanguard and there's other people not acting very much like God's kid. And maybe that's you. Maybe you're watching this because you're getting credit, but you're not acting like God's kid. I want to encourage you. If you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you are God's kid. Start acting like God's kid, right? Not, not just because, oh, Pastor Mike said I have to. Obviously, you're not going to just because I said you had to. You're old enough to go and do whatever you want. But I want to say this clearly. You are God's kid. So be God's kid. Identify as God's kid. You and I are a child of God. You are a child of God. And I think it's important in this understanding of, as us being children of God to know who God is. So I want to give just a, a clarity of God's character as a father. So God is a father to the fatherless. Okay, so maybe you didn't grow up with a father or you haven't felt like your father's been there. I can identify with that. Psalm 10, 14 says, but you, O God, do see trouble and grief. You consider it to take it in hand. The victim commits himself to you. You are the helper of the fatherless. Or in other versions, you are a father to the fatherless. God sees your suffering. He knows when you're not covered or when you felt uncovered and you felt unprotected and you were hurting and you felt alone. And he says he comes in and he helps the victim. He helps the oppressed. And yes, you could grow up totally affluent and still be oppressed. Did you know that? I know I was a youth pastor of affluent kids for seven years of my youth pastoring. And sometimes the most affluent kids are the most oppressed. And you're like, well, how's that? Because they're numbed by their affluence. Sometimes it's brokenness that leads us to the foot of the cross most easily. I'm not saying it's great to be poor. And I grew up as a poor kid. But I'm saying it was because of my poverty that maybe there was a brokenness and my brokenness. I, was, I had both in. I had poor and poverty and uh, uh, in, in many respects. And we were on food stamps and all that. And I didn't have a, a put together house. So the Lord was the, it was like 
like when Peter says, who else are we gonna go to? Yours are the words of life. I didn't have anybody else. Like, wow, you sound desperate. I was, and I'm so thankful God took me. God Almighty still accepted me. And so he accepts you. He's a father to the fatherless. He's a loving father. And if that first thing didn't translate in that, let me say it this way, 1 John 3, 1. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. So sometimes the world's not gonna know you. They're not gonna be like, so what? You're God's kid, okay. Big deal, big whoop. You're nothing special. But let me say this, you are something special. And it's not because of you. It's because of what Jesus did for you. It's because of what he did on the cross. That's why, that's why Easter is so important. Some people are like, yeah, Easter, whatever. No, we must stop and thank God for what he did for us, that we could be called children of God, that what love the fathers lavish. The word lavish is just, just poured out. It's like overflowing oil, just dripping down the lavishment of God's love, that we would be called children of God. So he's a father of the fatherless. He's a loving father. He's an embracing father. We're told in John 1, 12, yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. We are born of God. We are embraced by God. We are welcomed in to his family. He has given us the right to become children of God through Christ. So not only is he a father to the fatherless, a loving father, an embracing father, he's a holy and righteous father. Another word to sum it up, I would say he's a protective father. He protects you, his righteousness. Our God is a consuming fire. Don't think that doesn't protect you. His angels protect you. Psalms, uh, what is it, Psalm 91. He gives his angels charge concerning you. He's a protecting father. First Peter 1, 14 through 15 says, as obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance, that is before Christ, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all that you do. So God is holy. That's his strength. And so let's be holy as God is holy. Are you going to always get it right? No. But what does 1 John 1, 9 say? It says, it says, as we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's continue to live in that continual attitude of repentance and, and where we're accepted before God, before the Father. So I hope you take on those attributes of God that he's a father to the fatherless, he's a loving father, he's an embracing father, and he's a holy and righteous, or rather a protecting father. So we are God's children. We are children of God. So and now you're gonna be like, well, that, you already said that. No, I didn't. So check this out. Not only that, third, third point here, we are accepted as God's children. Verse 15. Now the word accepted, if you look in it, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna define it because I'm gonna later define the word affirmed. Okay. The word accepted is, it's generally approved, normal, right, acceptable. So we are God's children. We are accepted as God's children. So we're God's children through the power of the Spirit, by the power of the Spirit, but we are accepted as God's children by Him. It's like this. My freshman year in baseball, I tried out for the team and I gave my everything. I learned how to crow hop that day. Nobody taught me to crow hop before. Again, I didn't have my dad at home. So nobody, and crow hop, it's where you, for those who don't know you, to hurl the ball from the outfield mostly uh, or from a deep place where you need to get the ball with more velocity. Throw a guy out at home or something like that. So I learned how to crow hop the day I tried out and I was still working on it. So I tried out for the team and I had a nightmare that night that I didn't make it. Now, mind you, I went to a high school of 3,000 students, Apple Valley High School. Only high school in the whole town, but every student went there unless they went to a private school. So uh, my freshman class was about 900 students. So I was competing for I think the team was, there was room for about 25 kids. I was competing for 20, there's 25 spots and over a hundred freshmen trying out for this team. So it was hard. It was hard. So I tried out and didn't make it. Cut, not accepted. Not accepted. So that year, my arm, my elbow was hurting like crazy. And um, I don't know what it was, ulnar or something or other. And uh, I went to the doctors, it would hurt at night. It just was bad. A guy uh, came to our church who had a healing ministry, prayed over me. He, my arm got healed. No joke. Like that, healed. So um, I began to work out my sophomore year, came back my junior year and tried out. And I had been in fall ball. I'd been trying out, uh, working with the team, just working my tail off because I'm not the most gifted athlete, but I was doing my best. 
And so I sold these <clears throat> little uh, meal cards, and you probably have seen them before, uh, $10 each, and the team gets like half, at least half the, the, the stuff from it to, to buy stuff for the team. So I brought back, you know, my portion um, of what I sold to Coach Kent. He's the varsity coach of the team. And uh, I tried out again for my, my junior year and got cut again. So it's like, dude, you are a glutton for punishment, perhaps. And so I wasn't accepted. So I, I went to Coach Kent's office because he was also teaching a class. And um, I said, here you go, Coach. And he said, uh, said thanks. Uh, what, what's your name? I said, Mike Whitford. He, he goes, I, I said, I, you know, I just got cut from the team. He goes, well, why don't you come back out? I forget how the conversation went exactly. He said, why don't you come back out today? I said, really? He said, yeah. I said, okay. So I came out, uh, back out to the field, did all the mechanics and stuff, and uh, realized that um, I was um, uh, up to bat soon. And this was intimidating. My friend Doug was pitching. So I got up to bat, and he puts one right down the middle, and I just clocked it out out of the park, literally a home run over the left field fence. Coach Kent happened to be walking by when that happened. He goes, who is that? I said, Mike Whitford, sir. He nodded at me, wrote down something, and kept walking. Next day, my name's on the list. I couldn't believe it. I was accepted. I got accepted onto the baseball team. Mind you, it was the junior varsity, my junior year, but I'll take it. And then, of course, the next year was varsity in my senior year. So I made the junior varsity team and uh, got to play baseball at my high school. I worked so hard for that, but I was accepted. It was something generally approved. It was right, it was acceptable. I'd done my time beforehand, I'd worked hard, I'd gone to tryouts, I hit a home run, they saw that I could hit the ball, okay. And I'm not huge, so the fact that I could pull it down the line like that was uh, really helpful for me uh, to make the team. And so uh, from there, I was able to make the team, I was accepted. So we are accepted as God's children. You are accepted as God's children. Generally speaking, you are God's child. I kind of went over that already. But now the next thing is in verse 16, not only that, we are affirmed. Okay, if you read in verse 16, it says, for his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. So again, there's the Holy Spirit. Through the Holy Spirit, we are affirmed that as God's children. So we're accepted as God's children, but why would it have to say accepted as God's children and affirmed as God's children? other than the fact that there's something deeper going on here. Now, the word affirmed is defined this way. Accepted, generally approved. Affirmed is positively stated or asserted, often in a formal manner, recognition, approval. And so the affirmation, it says, it's like the Spirit is affirming, is approving. You are a child of God. You belong to the Father. It is positively uh, asserted, not just generally understood, but it is asserted. No, it is declared. It's like somebody's declaring over you, not just you declaring it, but somebody else is saying, you are a child of God. The spirit of God is affirming. His, his spirit bears witness with our spirit and affirms that we are children of God, affirming in our spirit through that. And so there is this deep approval. An example of that is when I was ordained. I had been a pastor, uh, licensed to preach is what the Assemblies of God calls it early on in my ministry, but in 2013, I was able to be ordained as an Assemblies of God minister. And so credential is one thing, and, and I was a pastor, they say you can marry and bury, um, but I was a pastor, full-on pastor, but in 2013, there's ordination, which you have to go through a whole bunch of different uh, uh, quality um, uh, understandings of, of you as a minister and being affirmed by those around you as a viable candidate of ministry to be ordained. And something happened that day. I just, it was like I told you about when I was at the altar. I wept as they put this shawl over my shoulders as a symbol of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I, I was like, I'm not worthy. I was like, I felt like Peter. Like, I, I am not worthy to have Jesus wash my feet type thing where they're, they're anointing me with oil and put, I'm like, and they give me a shepherd's staff that I have and they give me a new Bible. And I'm like, I'm not worthy of this recognition. I'm still hit with the emotion now. I'm not worthy of this. And yet the affirmation was there to say, yeah, we're none of us are worthy basically, but the father's called you into ministry and we affirm the calling of the, of the father upon your life, that you are called by God. We affirm that call in your life. And that's beautiful. The call is one thing, but to be affirmed as a son of God, that's all of us. You don't need to be ordained to be a son or a daughter of God. 
I'm ordained because that's my call into ministry full time. But your call, that is your affirmation as God's son or God's daughter, is without anything except the one thing with Romans distinguishes and that is that you accept Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit comes in and affirms you as a child of God. What a beautiful thing. See, the difference here from where you're accepted is there's a lifelong pursuit. There's a not giving up. There's a this is it. This is it. This is it. A depth of understanding the affirmation of the Spirit in you as being adopted as a child of God. Last but not least, verse 17, we are heirs with Christ of the Father's glory and of Christ's sufferings. And that goes hand in hand because we are both accepted and affirmed as children of God. We are heirs of God's glory. That is, we are heirs of life, eternal life. Some people say, well, it's not about going into heaven to accept Jesus. Just don't accept Jesus just to go into heaven. I'm like, well, yeah, I guess if you put it that way, but accept Jesus to have life, accept Jesus to live by the spirit, accept Jesus to be children of God, to be considered a son or daughter of God. Yes, it is good to be a child of God. It is good to be known as his child. See, we are heirs of life with Christ, but we also partake in his sufferings. But you kind of already knew that as we went through Easter, right? We are to take up our cross daily, as Luke 9, 23 says, and follow Jesus. We need to look to Jesus for the fullness of our meaning and be willing to suffer on his behalf. The world, I would say, from my perspective, I don't know if you see it as I see it, and that's okay if you don't, and I'm sure others my age and older would say this, it's getting darker, it seems. Even the things that I used to enjoy more uh, tend to not, well, let's say, affirm the things of God. And I, I recognize that and go, you know what? Wow, maybe, maybe I don't need to make that as important as it has been in my life up to this point. Maybe, dare I say, baseball is not as important as it has been in my life. Maybe these things that I once loved are not as important as I thought they should be. And that's okay because one day I'm going to have to give it up anyway. But that's a small, that's like a first world suffering, right? There are brothers and sisters around the world who are suffering for the gospel. And so is it too much for us to sacrifice our flesh, that is our desires, right? Is it too much to then say, I wanna live by the Spirit and I, I choose to, to, to put my flesh aside so that I can live by the Spirit as the Spirit affirms me as a child of God? I was on a walk with Koufax, our dog, just this last week. And we we're walking on the sidewalk and you know, the sidewalk's meant for walking, right? Well, this guy was riding his bike on the sidewalk and I have to get out of the way of my dog. I'm like, oh great, I have to get out of the way. But as he, he rode by, he said, good morning, son. I didn't know, have a clue who this guy was. No clue. He didn't look anything like me. I'll just put it that way. And I didn't look anything like him. But he said, good morning, son. And it was done in this, this affirming way. I'm not his son. And I began to weep. I'm like, why am I crying? I'm gonna walk with my dog? 45 years old crying because this guy said, good morning, son. And it was because I felt like the father was saying good morning to me. I know you may go, well, that's crazy. Listen, as a, as a kid who grew up without his dad around and a stepdad that was horrible, I know when the father, my heavenly father, is speaking to me. I know when he's speaking to me because I've had to tune into his voice for sheer survival and life. And he was speaking to me that morning and I began to weep. Good morning, son. I didn't hear that. I don't remember my dad ever saying that. He'll say I love you on the phone, but I didn't live with him long enough to hear good morning, son. Want some breakfast? I didn't hear that. He didn't hear that from my stepdad for sure. Good morning, son. Good morning, dad. And so it was like the father was letting me know that he saw me. And I knew right then he wasn't just saying good morning to me. He's saying good morning to you. The father says, good morning, son. Good morning, Tyler. I love you. I see you. I accept you. I affirm you. I don't affirm your sin, but that's okay. You can come to me. I embrace you. And as I embrace you, I'll cover your sin through my son's shed blood as you confess. First John 1, 9. I affirm you, though, as my son and my daughter. 
I affirm you as my son or as my daughter. I affirm you as my child because you've accepted my son, Jesus Christ, as your Lord and Savior. And that's the key, acceptance of Jesus Christ. So what do we do? Just keep on loving on Jesus. Keep seeking Jesus. He's the key to all of this. What he did for us on the cross and rising from the dead, he's the key to everything because through him we have access to the throne of God. Through Jesus Christ, the spirit of God comes in us and through the spirit then we cry, Abba, Father, because his spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are his children and he has adopted us. We were lost without a spiritual home until the Father God sent his son that we may be grafted in as we're told in Romans, grafted in as children of God. See, especially if you're not Jewish, we don't have even time to get into this. We're Gentiles, most of us. We don't deserve salvation through the, the plan of God, through the Messiah, the Jewish Messiah. But yet God has grafted us in. He's chosen to allow us to come and be called children of God. How great the love of the Father is that he lavished upon us, that we would be called children of God. I think of the song Reckless Love. I, I'm going to read a few lines and I'm going to pray us out. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You've been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so kind to me. It goes, oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God that chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99, and I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. He fights for you. He loves you. He's your father. You are adopted. You are a child of God. Let the love of God come in you and fill you in such a way that you receive. So Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you that we are children of God, that we are accepted as children of God. And some will recognize that around us, others won't care, but we care. We are affirmed by the Spirit, that our spirit bears witness with the Holy Spirit that we are children of God and that we know that you are a loving Father, you are an embracing Father, you are a holy Father, you are a good Father. So we say yes to you, Lord. Now, as we continue in this series of Adopted, I pray that these students will hear the voice of God. So maybe it's a good morning, son, a good morning, daughter, or just I love you, I accept you. Now come and be with me, and I'll show you how to live a life that is righteous and full of the Spirit. So, Father, we give you thanks that you've not left us as orphans, but you've given us life through your Son, Jesus Christ. And we say yes and amen to that. We love you, God. Thank you for adopting us as your children in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. And uh, I hope you'll join us for this series. We've got a lot of great uh, speakers ahead. Pastor Crystal speaks tomorrow at the live chapel. So make sure you're a part of that if you're on campus. And listen, embrace what God has for you. He's got us all on a journey. Just keep your eyes on Jesus through it all. Take care.